Thanks, Barry. Next up is Alan Gibson from the National Union of Journalists. Um, I just want to make one point, a couple of points clear about the Daily Mail. The Daily Mail was one of the first newspapers to climb on the anti-union bandwagon after Rupert Murdoch smashed the print unions at Wapping 30 years ago. The management here issued all of its journalists with personal contracts which effectively marginalised bargaining rights of this, of this newspaper. And that's a situation that's continued ever since. I think it also needs to be said that the, that the newspaper industry has been one of the industries that's been in the forefront of casualising work, um, casualising labour, putting people on short-term contracts, bringing about a situation of incredible precari pre an incredible precarious situation. I'm not too sure whether or not the CLR contracts the system is building, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if that is in fact the case. Now, there's another thing about trade unions is that we're not just here to bargain for better wages and conditions and all the rest of it. We also take on a whole number of other issues, particularly political issues. And we also, in terms of the National Union of Journalists, we've also been very, very deeply serious about trying to maintain ethical standards within, within the journalist industry, within journalism. Uh, that means doing things like, for example, when the Daily Star tried to issue a newspaper called the Daily Fatwa about seven or eight years ago, our members of the Daily Star organised, went to the editor and said, we refuse to work on this disgusting anti-Muslim rag. And the newspaper was, was obliged, had to back down. They were not able to print that particular rag. Whereas my own feeling, and I'm sure it's shared by many, that the scandals that we saw at Wapping, the scandals that we saw at the News of the World, the phone hacking scandals that were over the years, and which the Liberty Party was set up to investigate, none of this would have happened if the National Union of Journalists had managed to keep its uh, had managed to keep a position within the industry. We would have been able to have kept some sort of moral standard, kept some sort of ethical standard within within the copy that was being produced on those newspapers, in the way that they were putting stories to get together. We would have been the, the whistleblower, if you like, that would have stopped these scandals ever coming about. It's what we were able to do before the print unions were smashed. The print unions were able to stop some of the really nasty scandals going ahead, like the Sun wanting to print a picture of Arthur Scargill doing, allegedly doing a whole a hard Hitler salute at the height of the Nile strike. That was stopped. That was stopped by the print unions. So in other words, an organised workforce can stop outrages like the phone hacking and like, and like this recent incident. To what degree, uh, we can talk all day about the, 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 the moral standards or the, or the lack of moral standards that the Daily Mail has fallen into over the years. But it's my own belief that with, a, with an organised trade union in that building, a number of these scandals would never have come about. And I'll just finally finish on one point. One of the things that the National Union of Journalists called for during the Medicine Inquiry was a conscience clause. A clause that would allow journalists and sub-editors and so on to refuse to work on particular stories that they, that they did not agree with, that they had a, politi a particular political reason for not working on. And particularly with the tax on asylum seekers and immigrants, the tax on gay people, and so on. The list goes is, is endless, which is precisely obviously the reason why the editors and the management of these newspapers do not want anything whatsoever to do with such a thing. But if they do, if they were forced to do it, they would pay it lip service. Because at the end of the day, the only way that you could possibly ever keep a conscience clause like that in standing would be through an organised workforce, would be through strong trade unionism. That's why I finally appeal. There are members of, of my union in that building right now. They, they face a fantastically bullying atmosphere. Dakin is renowned for his bullying. The whole newspaper industry is in fact renowned for his bullying. One of the things that came out of the Leveson Inquiry very, very clearly. And again, the only way that you can combat that sort of atmosphere, the only way that you can combat that sort of bullying is through a strong trade union. And what better time to try and rebuild the union in that building 
The management is in crisis. This political crisis has produced a crisis within our building. There's absolutely no doubt about that. What better time now to turn around to management and say, recognise us. Give us back our bargain rights. Give us a nice big fat pay rise. Give us more, give us more people on permanent contracts. If there are zero hours contracts in this building, then do what the hell this work is still in legal recently. And let's force their management to back down and agree that no worker would ever be employed in that on those sorts of conditions. That's what we need to do now, not just in this building here, but right throughout the whole East paper industry. We need to get rid of the scourge of casualisation, bring back ten, ten, bring back permanent employment and, and fight back for, for all, to win back all the things that we've lost over the last 30 years of de-recognition. That's it.